Well, it's a great honor to talk to you, Dr. Doudner. Well, uh, in the past 10 years, these small islands like Hawaii have been made famous by one person uh, who has um, risen up to the presidency in the United States. And now we have another one, uh, which is uh, likely to be another uh, Nobel Prize winner. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about your very interesting education background in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, well, I grew I up... I was told that yeah. you failed your chemistry in yeah. secondary school. Ah, but yes. But you love French. And it was yet your French tutor or teacher yeah. who pushed you back to that wonderful, wonderful field called chemistry. And then here you are. And then here I am. <laughs> so, yes, I uh, grew up on the big island of Hawaii in, in a town called Hilo. And I went to Hilo High School, where, ch where I met my chemistry teacher, who turned me on to the joy of doing science. And I went off to college thinking that I would uh, major in biochemistry. But I got uh, discouraged when I was a freshman in college, taking uh, general chemistry and struggling in that class. Loved my French class and uh, went to my French teacher telling her that maybe I was going to change my major. But when she heard my major was chemistry, she said, oh, no, you should stay with chemistry. Mm. So I really, uh, you know, I think I owe her in part, at least, to, you know, keeping me on course. Because honestly, I've always been excited about the process of discovery. It was just trying to figure out how I could contribute to the world of science. Mm. So you've been obsessed with the idea of discovery rather than memorizing all these chemical formulas yes, yeah. and equations. Exactly. Which is rather un-Asian because here, mm -hmm. the ed Asian education is a well-known of a bit of a spoon feeding, right? Well, I think that happens everywhere, honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think uh, I, I like to get away from the idea of memorizing too much. I think uh, these days, you know, you can uh, quickly look things up on your, on your mobile device. But, uh, but I think what we need to encourage is for students to, uh, you know, develop their sense of curiosity about the world and, uh, and to think about science as the process of solving a series of puzzles. I think yes. it's, it's fun, really. Yes. Yeah. So what would be your best advice to those science students now uh, who get stuck in a secondary school working hard for their exam? Uh, marks in order to get to a, a Princeton or Yale, whatever, for the time being. Whereas remaining, as you say, as curious as possible. Right? Yeah, it's a real challenge. I have a teenage son right now, and I see him getting caught up in this kind of, uh, you know, sort of competitive race to get into college. And, and I, I think it, it can detract from just the fundamental joy of learning. So I, I'm not quite sure how we combat this, but I think it's important to continue to encourage students to pursue what they're interested in, not what they think is going to look good on an application. And to, uh, that, that really I think one does one's best work when you are truly genuinely excited and interested in a subject. Mm -hmm. Now, to get back th to this um, uh, great uh, Dutnian notion, if I dare to uh, coin such an adjective, just like Shakespearean or Einsteinian, <laughs> great notion of CRISPR, right? <laughs> uh, well, as far as I know, it is um, about um, finding out or differentiating a DNA from the bacteria, which is uh, previously used by the bacteria to fight against viruses, right? which is amazing. It's just like it's just like um, discovering uh, that the, 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 the Taliban is equipped with a kind of machine guns, and then you take this uh, weapon from the, from the Taliban, right, which uh, have been used to fight against the ISIS. Right? You know, they fight each other anyway, right? And um, break them down and uh, reassemble them and then reinvent them into a new weapon uh, to be used by the U.S. Army. Hmm. Is that the right comparison? I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't think of CRISPR as an as a as a weapon. You know, I think I think of it as a uh, as a tool. Mm -hmm. I think of it as a. Um, I think of it as a kind of a surgical tool for DNA. Yeah. And it really is a technology that allows rewriting the code of life 
What does that mean? Well, it means being able to make a very precise change to the letters of the DNA in a cell, so precise that you could correct a genetic disease or you could introduce a change to DNA that would uh, give an organism a new ability. Mm, which is really revolutionary. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. what genetic diseases like most cancers, perhaps? Yeah? Sure. Mm. Yeah. So is that a complicated uh, process to get them re-edited or restructured well, and rearranged? Well, it depends on uh, how you define complicated. Mm. Um, it's a technology that's simple enough for scientists to use that it's been adopted by labs around the world already mm. to do uh, experiments in all sorts of different cells and organisms, plants, animals, fungi, bacteria. And, uh, but I think uh, what's, what's happening now is that there's a push towards um, use of, of gene editing in the clinic for treating uh, genetic disease and also for uh, creating new kinds of products that will be uh, found in supermarkets, including food products, uh, animal products, and uh, uh, what we call synthetic biology, so being able to harness organisms' abilities to make molecules that are industrially useful. All mm. of those things now are, are happening using CRISPR. Wow, that's amazing, right? Yeah. So how far away are you uh, from uh, implementing them uh, on some big diseases like HIV or stroke or cancer? Now? Yeah, so those three are going to be challenging for various reasons. I think uh, what, I would, what I would argue is that I think the earliest uh, uses of gene editing in clinical medicine will probably be for diseases like sickle cell anemia, um, possibly muscular dystrophy, uh, genetic diseases of the eye. These are all uh, disorders that have a very well-known single gene mm. that is defective that mm. could be corrected or changed mm. using gene editing in, in, a, in tissues where we know how to deliver the gene editing molecules into the cells. So is it, more, is it easier to work with bacteria and viruses and genes than working with people? How sure. far are you going to uh, persuade politicians and bureaucrats in the medical services to work with you effectively and make them understand mm. so that they would uh, just uh, be willing to spend enough money or budget and so that it would just uh, benefit right, the well-being of uh, the American people, if not mankind. Well, I think, you know, uh, technologies move forward in a very, I would argue, organic way meaning that uh, it's not driven by government regulators and politicians, it's actually driven by scientists and clinicians who are desiring to advance their science, um, advance medicine, treat patients effectively, and it's also driven by patients, right? There's a demand for treatments that will help people that have uh, otherwise intractable disease. So sickle cell disease is a great one to, to, to consider in this context because it's a disorder that we've understood the cause of for a long time. We know the genetic uh, basis for the sickle cell anemia. Um, but it's been up until recently impossible to actually cure it. Mm -hmm. And now we know that with gene editing we can do the, we can create the curative change in cells in the laboratory. And the current challenge is how to actually do that in a person. Mm -hmm. But that's coming. I, I, I really think it is. Right. Now you're working at uh, Berkeley now? I'm working at University of California, Berkeley. Yeah. yeah. The University of California has been um, donated uh, uh, with something like uh, 500 million by a single benefactor. Yes. Uh, in Hong Kong. Yes. And it's amazing that within such a short period, yes. you've managed to be so productive. How well, on earth did you do it? You have to do. You have to cut off a lot of red tapes, right? <laughs> you know, because departments here, yeah. here, departments yeah. fight with each other. Oh. First, they argue uh, where the money should go first, right? Well, you know that always goes on. It's yes. uh, it, it goes on everywhere. But I, I think what's what's been really exciting is uh, I think you're referring to Mr. Lee Kaohsiung and his uh, generosity to the University of California not just my campus, but other uh, campuses of the University of California. And, and uh, you know, I think that what we've seen is that with th that kind of philanthropic support of fundamental science, it's been an opportunity for scientists to, you know, really work together. In my case, we're, we're, uh, we created the Innovative Genomics Institute with initial uh, support from, from Mr. Lee. 
And this has enabled partnering between people like me that do fundamental discovery science with uh, doctors who are working actually with, you know, with actual patients and uh, helping us to come together in ways that we couldn't have done before to bring new discoveries that are coming out of research laboratories to the clinic as quickly as possible. Well, wow, that sounds quite a lot of solid work. It's exciting. So do you travel often, no? I am traveling often. Yes? Yes, mm, yeah. Right, and telling peoples in different parts of the world what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. To get the message across. Get the message across and to learn, myself, yes. to learn what people are doing, what their concerns are, what their thoughts are, uh, what their science is. It's, right. it's, it's, uh, it's very exciting. Okay, thank you very much. I hope uh, eventually when my life uh, is going to be prolonged by another 10 or 20 years, I don't know, at the end of uh, uh, something, right? And then my doctor will be telling me gladly, you should thank uh, someone called Jennifer Dodner. <laughs> 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 thank you for all you've been doing to the uh, well-being and to the happiness of mankind. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for... Uh, great contribution, right? Thank, thank you, you for chatting. Thank you.